All right. Well, I think we're live. <laughs> we are live wait. here. We'll wait a minute or two. Let's share the screen. To share. There we go. And then go like that. Cool. Here. This one. Okay. All right. Can you guys see our, you guys can see our uh, like slide, right? Natalie and Nikki? Yep. Slide and faces. Yep. Awesome. Oh. All right. So yeah, we're going to get started. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome. We are at the Women's International Beer Summit. Thanks for being here today and coming to our panel. Um, so today we're doing the Brew Talks, Water and Temp. Um, my name is Tyler. This is Lori. We uh, host a podcast called Brewed Up. And basically, we kind of talk and laugh and share stories about home brewing. Uh, craft beer, and whatever else comes to mind. So check us out. We put the links in the chat if you want to uh, listen to our podcast or follow us on, on social media. Um, and also, we are coming to you live from Simi Valley Homebrew Shop. That's where I work as a manager. Um, it's a great little homebrew shop in Simi Valley, California. We also ship nationally. So if you go to our website, Simi Valley Homebrew, um, and want to order anything, we can ship it out to you. And yeah, Lori, I'll get over to you. Oh, sorry. Before we get started, <laughs> there are just a few logistical things to go over. So Lori, now I'll give it to you. Okay. First of all, all the attendees are automatically on mute to eliminate any background noise during the event, but you can always ask questions in the chat that you have by submitting them through the ask the question box at the bottom of the screen. We'll get as many of those questions at the end of the presentation as we can during our time together. Also, if you see a question that's already been asked and you'd like to hear the answer, rather than repeating it, you can vote on it to make sure that it goes up in the priority list in the questions box. And the most popular questions will go to the top and those will get asked first. You can also make comments oh. throughout the event in the chat on the right hand side of your screen. But keep in mind that only questions in the official ask a question feed will be answered at the end of the event. So if you want it answered, make sure you put your question there. Um, it'll be posted links as we go. Keep an eye out for them. If you have any connectivity issues during this seminar or you notice that your video is lagging, a few things you can try. A quick refresh. Refreshing usually corrects most issues in Crowdcast. If that doesn't work, try clicking pause on your video player waiting a second, then hitting play. If neither of those options work, you can try lowering your video resolution by hovering your mouse over the video player and clicking the gear icon on the bottom right. From there, you can lower the resolution to either 720 or 360. Finally, <laughs> as a worst case scenario, you can try putting your video into compatibility mode. To do so, click the link on the bottom left underneath the live stream that says, get audio slash video help. You'll be prompted with some information about compatibility mode and how to activate it. We want to take a second to highlight these scholarship opportunities our sponsors have made available. Head over to the website and make sure you sign up for the scholarships you are interested. Winners will be drawn at random and notified by email after the summit. Last but not least, we are recording this event and rec recording will be available at this very same link a few minutes after we end the live broadcast. If you'd like to download the presentation slides, you can do so by clicking the green button at the bottom of your screen. All right, that's it from us. Now I'd like to hand it off to our speakers, our wonderful speakers for today. Um, go ahead and take it away. We have Natalie Baldwin, brewer at Breakside in Portland and Nikki Forster, brewer at Roar Bark. I'm still Burbach, really yeah. saying that name. <laughs> You're close, Rohrbach. Rohrbach <laughs> Brewing in uh, Rochester, New York. So we'll, we'll give it a uh, you. Welcome. Hey, I'm Natalie. It looks like Nikki's internet connection went out for a sec, so uh -oh. I will talk. She'll be back. I can feel it. Um, <laughs> but uh, hey, I'm Natalie. I'm the research and development brewer at Breakside in Oregon, like, like uh, Tyler said. And I've been there for a little over four years and have been brewing for close to seven years. Before that, I was at another brewing house called Burnside. And it was kind of funny, like when I first started brewing, I was at Burnside and then one of the only other like lady brewers in town was Whitney Burnside. And some people were like, are you Whitney? Did you work at Burnside? Are you Natalie? And whatever. But um, 
uh, all these years later, um, I have a pretty sweet job, and uh, looks like Nikki just texted me. She has to be added back in. Um, Tyler, we'll work, we'll work on that. Continue. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I started watching kegs at a at Burnside, and um, always kind of had a bit of a strong personality, and uh, pushed my way through. And then just as the lead brewer there, um, I learned kind of like old school brewing from there. And hi. Um, and it was kind of just like, I don't know, throw some bags in the, in the, in, you know, you'll make an IPA, it'll be fine. And I'm like, like a medium type A person. Like I brew a lot by feel, but I got to know like what's going on before I can like brew by feel. And, um, so I wanted to learn more from a lot more technical brewers. So I started at Breakside and everything is, um, very technical and, uh, yeah, it's been really great learning to brew there. Um, I like to get super weird and use interesting ingredients. I use a lot of flowers and um, fruits and herbs and spices. And yeah, but today we'll go a little bit out of my wheelhouse. We'll talk about some uh, water chemistry and uh, IPAs. And I'll hand it over to Nick. Awesome. Uh, thanks for getting me back in. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that something would go wrong right off the bat. Um, Excellent. So to follow Natalie, uh, my name is Nikki Forster. I uh, work at Rohrbach Brewing Company in Rochester, um, New York. And Rohrbach is uh, named after a, a small town in Germany where our um, owner actually spent a couple of years um, after college um, and learned about beer and, and all those things. So that's why um, it's kind of a, a tougher name to pronounce. It's not an English um, word necessarily. So um, we actually have two breweries, um, two locations um, where we are. I am in the downtown uh, production facilities. So we make our six classic styles um, and then all of our seasonals and one-offs and things like that. Um, we do a we run on a 20 barrel system. So if a barrel of beer is 31 gallons, um, every time I'm mashing in, we're usually making around 630 gallons of beer um, per brew day. Uh, well, per brew, <laughs> sometimes three times a day over two shifts and all of that. So um, I get to do all the hot side stuff um, from mashing in to actually knocking out the wort to the, the fermenter. Um, but I'm also um, in charge of recipe development and um, recipe translation. We do some contract brewing for some smaller breweries. Um, so taking their ideas and then creating um, the recipe so that it reflects what they're looking for um, and so that we can work it on our system and make seven barrel batches instead of 20, uh, those types of things. And I'm also um, getting a lot into um, quality um, and lab work. So we've recently purchased quite a bit of lab um, equipment. Um, so we run um, tests on our fermenting beers, on our bright tank beers, on um, forced wort samples, uh, all these different things to make sure that the products that we're putting out um, are free from any spoilage bacteria or um, weird off flavors that we don't really want in the finished product. So um, get to do a lot of kind of fun, cool things. Um, and I love the people that I work with and that makes a huge difference too. So that's all about me. Cool, so cool. thanks for those intros. I think um, we can get the presentation started. So who wants to go first? All right, um, I will clunkily share my screen with everyone. Oh shit, I did it, you guys. <laughs> I mean, mostly. Now I don't actually know how to start the presentation. Oh, here we go. Cool. Um, so I just put together a little bit of a presentation here because there is a, you know, we're talking about water profiling, which is what Nikki's going to mostly focus on. And then I'm going to talk about yeast and temperature control fermentation. But the tricky part about this whole topic is that we're going to dance along the lines of a lot of really technical stuff. 
And I know there's a lot of pro brewers, home brewers um, here. So again, we're just going to dance along along the tips of things here. So the two different things I have uh, to show you is a West Coast IPA and um, a hazy IPA. And they're just going to be a couple different alterations in the recipe, the base recipe from the malt all the way to the fermenter. Um, that uh, small alterations that will change the um, the fermentation and outcome of your beer. Uh, it's a little bit weird because I can't see my face. I can just see the uh, the um, screen. So if I do anything weird, sorry. <laughs> you look great. No worries yet. All right. So. Obviously, we all know what a West Coast IPA is. Um, we're trying to make something hop forward, clear, uh, with high flocculation, low ester uh, and phenol production, and not super dry, but fairly dry. Um, a lot of the uh, West Coast IPAs or American IPAs is kind of like a base recipe that we use at Breakside. And um, you know, you could use two-row, you can use English malt, just kind of, you know, we all know the main diastatic power for our base malt, and then Munich, Vienna, the crystal malts are going to help with that flavor, so you don't have a completely dry, bitter beer, but I'm, we all know this. But um, when Nikki dives into water profile, I just wanted to give you the reference for the... Um, Sulfate to chloride ratio here. We usually target around the 5.3 pH. We mash in around, you know, 152, 153, 154. Uh, you know, it's harder at home, you know, home brewing to hit mash temps, but in our brewery, it's a little bit tricky as each season transitions because our groundwater is a different temperature. And sometimes there's a couple weeks at the beginning of the winter when we miss our mash temperatures because the it's harder to dial in water temperature as you're blending um, hot liquor and brown water to get your strike temperature. So sometimes it like takes a little bit to dial that stuff in and we can always tell when our beer is finished drier and more bitter. Um, and we generally use uh, 001 or Chico for our um, for our ale fermentation. That's because of the low um, ester phenol production, and I messed up the fermentation temperature here, but we generally um, knock out to the fermenter at 66 and set the tank to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and um, that way we get a little bit of ester production, get the yeast uh, moving a little bit before the glycol turns on, and then um, I put pitch rate here. This is something else that's like pretty tricky to um, talk about without getting really technical uh the way that we pitch our uh 001 beers we and it's also with our hazy beers we pitch um 0.75 million cells per milliliter uh and for a 13.5 plato beer that's about 10 million cells we do a one-to-one -one dilution um five milliliters of water and five milliliters of our sample wort from the tank of pitched beer with pitched yeast in it, and then that way we get a um, sample of our uh, cells that are in there. Um, obviously, if you under pitch, over pitch, you can get, um, you can get off flavors or um, drier beer, and then another uh, portion of the whole pitch rate and um, yeast health going into the fermenter's aeration. Uh, it is important to aerate your beer, obviously. And we was talking to a bunch of different brewers this week, and I was like, how do you aerate your beer? And everyone has a completely different calculation, or they kind of, um, one of my coworkers uh, just left and is the head brewer at this brewery in Seattle. And I was like, hey, how are you going to like calculate how you aerate? And he's like, it's so complicated because you have, the length of knockout, you have length as in time, uh, the length of knockout, the length of hose, the flow rate of the beer, flow or the wort, the flow rate of the oxygen. And um, so generally brewers uh, target, you know, 10 ppms of oxygen. Um, but I think we probably do like 20 or 30. And 
our yeast health is consistent because we aerate five liters per minute for um, 30-ish minutes is our knockout to the tank. And because we do that from our prop and continuously through all of our fermentations, we have pretty consistent yeast health. But if you were to um, lower your aeration after your yeast is used to being aerated five liters per minute and you drop it down to, you know, like three, then you're going to have completely different yeast health um, than you would if it, because it's already adapted to that, if that makes sense. Again. Dancing on uh, the top of that. And then just a, a difference here. Um, something that I think is really important, like the reason why I'm talking about recipe development here is, especially with hazy IPAs, the difference between that and American IPAs is managing um, your terminal gravity, right? Like we all know about mash rest, and I think Kat later this afternoon is going to talk about recipe development a little bit more in detail, but um, with these beers, you're trying to take care of the yeast from the very beginning of your brew day until it's in your glass, right? Like flocculation, yeast health, um, and one thing that, you know, talking to my boss about what, what we manage a lot in our um, hazy IPs is um, terminal gravity. Uh, so we're paying attention to residual sugars that you're getting from the mash. That would be differentiation between um, adding more oats, wheat, um, caramel malts, and then obviously the addition of lactose or maltodextrin. So, you know, you can focus on mouthfeel so that you can add um, sugars or, you know, unfermentable sugars, and then um, malts that have more of a mouthfeel, wheat, caraway, wheat, oat, things like that. So you have residual sugars, starch, and then um, obviously the sugars. So when we design a recipe here, we know that if our mash temperature varies a little bit, 154 to 156, and we have a higher diastatic powered mash, then even if it's a hazy IPA and it's supposed to finish at four Play-Doh, sometimes it still finishes you know, at 2.7 or something like that. And um, there's a little bit of give and take with managing that portion of the fermentation. Like adding, like if you make a hazy IPA and you really like the, you like the malt bill, you like the way all the malt tastes, but it dries out all the way, do, do you need to um, adjust by adding a little lactose? And even though you don't want a super sweet beer, is your beer still going to ferment all the way out and you need to compensate with a little lactose? That's not personally what I like to do all the time, but it is a method that you can use. And then when you um, incorporate your water profiling, um, this is a one-to-one -one, um, sulfate to chloride ratio. I'm just gonna go through here. So this is a cheat sheet. I'm like really terrible at water profiling. Not necessarily um, because I don't have the experience, because for some reason I just like can't get it into my head. So this is a cheat sheet that I made for myself. These numbers are PPM. Um, so like the hoppy beer is a base guideline of where I have my PPM for um, each style of beer. And uh, you get, let me see if I actually, oh, here we go. Um, so the reason that those are isolated and specific to beer styles is because if you break down to each of these ions, you can pay attention to um, what they do. So calcium um, obviously lowers pH, helps with mash efficiency, and um, increases the flocculation. Um, magnesium also lowers pH and um, helps with yeast health. So if we go back to this other one, I have um, 20 ppm of magnesium as like a base um ppm for all beers just for meat health and then um if you are making a hazy beer your sulfate to chloride ratio would have the sulfate um a little bit lower so that your um, hop bitterness isn't as bright so if you're trying to accentuate um, malt flavor then you can increase your chloride ratio um, but again, not my specialty. So this is my cheat sheet for it. Um, 
and hopefully uh, Nikki will go over how to use all of these numbers, but I figured this would be a good uh, reference point for y'all. Um, and then this is something that I was suggested. Uh, there's so many different reference points for going through how to uh, incorporate water profiling to your recipe development, but I think if you take a step back and just know for yourself what uh, water profiles taste like. I mean, you could even take this a step further. And whenever I'm running off of beer, I taste a uh, first running, a last running, and pre boil. And I just taste what it, I'll just like kind of put my finger in the sample and taste it. And I know that, oh, we must be at the end of the silo because this tastes fairly husky. Or, um, I don't know, this is a little bit odd tasting. And if you get to know your beers more and more, then it's obvious if there's going to be a problem or um, you need to adjust anything. And if you apply that to water science, then you can know exactly what all of these specific uh, compounds taste like. I didn't put lactic acid on here because I wasn't sure what the, uh, like, I don't know if you've ever gotten lactic acid on your skin and it, like, gives you, like, a little white burn. Um, so I wasn't sure if you could just drink that. Like, I don't know what volumes you could do, so I didn't put that on there. So maybe don't do that or look it up. Um, but, yeah, if you just put, you know, room temperature water or warm up to dissolve the salt, you can just start with one milliliter of water and then just add one gram of each of these compounds and see what gypsum tastes like and see what um, calcium chlora or carbonate tastes like so that you know when you're adding it to beer, what is it going to do? And um, it seems kind of simple and ridiculous, but uh, it helps me a lot in understanding how I design recipes. Um, and I'm going to exit the screen. I'll share these uh, slides with y'all so that you um, know, or so you have uh, those access points later. Awesome. Um, that was an awesome, first of all, lots of cool suggestions that I hadn't even thought of. Um, so thank <laughs> you for sharing. Um, and a, a great segue into the next part where we're going to dive a little bit deeper into water chemistry, um, understanding a few things, some disclaimers. Um, I am not a chemist. Um, my background is in psychology. I've got a master's in counseling. Um, so naturally, that's how I became a brewer. Um, and uh, so not not a, an expert in this. Um, this is a really complex topic. Um, and the goal of the session is to try to give you some tools to take away, um, no matter where you are as a brewer, um, that you can decide what works for you, what doesn't, um, but hopefully give you some tools to um, to use as you're de designing recipes and, and brewing. Um, and also um, water, adjusting your water. Um, can you make good beer without making adjustments to your water? Um, absolutely. I mean, unless you're brewing from, you know, well water or you have like an incredibly high amount of um, metals um, in, in the water that you have, you can make good beer with drinkable water. Um, but we're talking about now taking your brewing to the next level and what makes the difference between a GABF medal winning Goza um, hey. and something that, um, you know, is just, it's good. Um, it, and and it, it boils down to quality ingredients and um, things like water chemistry. Um, so gaining an understanding of that can really help you um, enhance your skills as a brewer. So um, bear with me. Um, we're going to do the best we can to keep this um, as simple as possible and give you some tools, but um, no no promises here. So we'll get, um, hopefully we'll get kicked off here, um, a screen share going. Um, again, we'll be sharing this information with you. Um, so don't feel like you have to, you know, um, take crazy notes or anything, just kind of follow along, um, jot down any questions in the chat if, as you have them, and hopefully we'll be able to answer a bunch of these um, in a little bit. So um, first of all, 
already said um, that's how you spell Rohrbach, <laughs> in case you were curious. Um, but we talk about the, the the four main ingredients in brewing beer. Um, you know, when it comes to malt and hops, yeast, um, and water. Um, water is the biggest ingredient we put in our mash tun, um, so it's really important that we do pay attention to it. What's in it? Um, understand. Uh, what those minerals are, what they do, and how we can um, help our water um, make better beer or use our water to make better beer. Um, so three kind of takeaways that I hope you um, remember from today. Um, if you do nothing else to your water, especially as a home brewer, um, get the chlorine out of your water. Um, chlorine and chloramine are used by um, water treatment plants to basically kill off bacteria um, that is, you know, makes water um, harmful to drink. Um, so that's a pretty um, important thing, and it's a really easy thing that you can do. Um, all of these um, salts and um, acids and some things that we're talking about here. Um, are, you can get online from homebrew shops. You can go to your local homebrew shop. You can, if you have a chem rep, obviously at a commercial brewery, um, you can get these types of things. Um, but getting rid of chlorine is really important because chlorine left over in beer um, is uh, basically gives off a, a really strong off flavor, uh, especially in homebrew um, from a class of um, compounds called chlorophenols. Um, which end up, if you've ever had a beer that kind of tastes spicy, a little clovey, maybe even plasticky or um, like the smell of a Band-Aid, um, that's chlorophenol. And um, those chlorophenols, that class of compounds, you get mostly from um, chlorine um, or chloramine in your water. Um, so that's a big takeaway. Uh, the second one is we're going to start to look at how to um, read and, and get some information off your water profile. Um, and the third takeaway is the best treatment is often the least treatment. So if you're not 100% sure of what you're doing, we want you to kind of pump the brakes, go slow, think about um, these water salts and things, uh, the adjustments as um, akin to, you know, cooking. Um, you know, if you're making a, a, you know, chicken breast on the stovetop, um, you don't take a thing of kosher salt and just dump it in there and then a whole thing of peppercorns. You start with little kind of sprinkles and taste things as you go along. Um, so that's um, something good to be considering and thinking about when it comes to water chemistry. You don't want to go big or go home with water chem. Um, so chlorine, chloramine, um, we talked about why it's added to municipal water su supplies and how it can react with uh, malts that create undesirable off flavors. So how do you get rid of it? Um, you can boil your water overnight, um, let it sit overnight, and that will um, boil off chlorine. But chloramine is a much um, more stable, um, whatever we want to call it. It's not an element. It's an additive. Um, and it won't boil off like chlorine will. So um, there's two pretty easy ways to, to get around that. Um, at our brewery, we have um, a carbon filtration system. Um, so we're replacing our filters every couple months, depending on how much water we're using. Um, so you can do that with your water at home. Um, if you've got like a Brita filter and you want a Brita filter, you know, nine gallons of water, um, you know, over the course of a week, um, that could take out some of the chlorine and chloramine. Or the easiest way is go to your um, homebrew supplier and buy a bag of Camden tablets. It's a uh, potassium metabisulfate um, or sulfite. They look like... Um, pills basically you get a pack of a hundred of them for four bucks you take that tablet you kind of crunch it up with your fingers sprinkle it over your water um, before you start brewing and one tablet will treat 20 gallons of water and it'll get rid of the chlorine and chloramine from your water so super easy tip um, why is it important to know your brewing water? Um, because water can really have an impact on a lot of different things, um, not only in the, the final products, the, the beer that you're making, the taste, um, but your, the way that your mash performs, the way that your um, enzymes work, the way that your yeast ferments, um, the, the wort that you've made, um, the way that your product looks, um, all of those different things. Um, 
come back to water and um, the minerals and ions in it and how it affects the, the pH, um, which we'll be talking a little bit about as well. Um, we're talking about using these seasonings to enhance our, our beers um, and, and um, how, how beer is expressed on the palate. Um, and obviously to try to um, avoid having off flavors or um, contaminants in our beer as well. So those are um, some good reasons to, to get to know your brewing water. Um, Cause there are various minerals and salts that are found in water that can accentuate good flavors as well as contribute undesirable flavors, um, which we're trying to avoid. Okay, so water reports. Um, I think as part of your um, packet of information you got, um, you should have gotten a water report from Rochester. Um, you might've gotten one from Portland. I sent two of them because I wasn't sure which one um, we wanted to use. Um, but it's a full water report. Um, it's not super up to date, but it gives us an idea of what we're looking for. Um, so there's six main ions um, that affect, um, have the biggest impact on brewing water and how it affects your beer. Um, those six elements you'll see uh, are ions listed, um, whether they're cations, so positively charged um, ions or negatively charged anions. You can see the little chemical um, formulas for them next to it. But we're looking primarily at calcium and magnesium, um, which combined um, with uh, alkalinity and, and stuff um, determines how hard your water is. Um, so um, really important, probably the most important ion um, we're talking about brewing is calcium and having a minimum amount, um, which helps with all of those um, things that we just uh, mentioned on the previous slide. Um, alkalinity sulfate, chloride, and sodium. Um, so most municipal water support uh, water reports will have that information listed in some format, um, hopefully parts per million. Uh, we'll talk about that too. Um, but that's what we're primarily looking for. So if I click on um, this water report sample, hopefully um, this will redirect. And Natalie, can you see the um, water report in front of you? I can't, it's just still the um, same slide. I think it's because you're sharing a tab. Okay, so let me see if I can stop. Wait a minute. Hold my drink, put some liquor in it. What's What do they say in the Brewer Mars song? <laughs> All right, hold on here. Bear with Not me, it. everybody. I apologize, this is... Um, all right, back here, share screen, tab. And then did you have the tab already open? Yep. Yeah. All right, let's see. How's that look? There she is. Monroe County Water Authority, there we go. All yep. right, so. <laughs> um, this, our primary water source in Rochester um, comes from Hemlock Lake. Even though we're right on Lake Ontario and Lake Erie is right across the way, um, our water comes from um, a reservoir um, fairly far from here, um, but it is treated. And you'll see a whole bunch of inorganics, metal, um, metals, physical parameters, things like that. Um, so in looking at this chart, um, what we're trying to do really is um, find those six ions. So if I'm looking for the amount of calcium that's in the water um, in Hemlock Lake, you'll see that um, there is an average of 27.3 parts per million um, of calcium um, in our, our water uh, supply. So across the board, Natalie's um, slide pointed to that. Um, you want at least 50 parts per million of calcium in um, pretty much anything you're brewing um, because your uh, pH um, depends on it, your yeast depend on it, a um, whole bunch of things are looking for calcium. So um, what I did was you have this chart and you can identify those six main um, ions. So we've got calcium, magnesium, um, second page here. Uh, sulfate was one of the ones we talked about. Alkalinity is being reported as 70 parts per million. Um, chloride, uh, total hardness, and then it also gives you um, the average pH. 
So our pH here typically is somewhere, uh, you know, just with a standard pH meter, you can read it as somewhere usually around um, 7.2 to 7.8. Um, so on this particular day, it was 7.8. So that's what you're looking for in your water report. Um, everybody who uses municipal water should be able to um, find that just by searching, Googling um, water report for you know whatever uh, city you live in. Um, and if you're not sure where your water comes from, you can certainly call your county water authority and ask. Um, you can go to Home Depot too, this is kind of random. Um, there's water sample um, test kits. Um, at our Home Depot, it's like on the way out the door, they've got like a display and it's completely free. You take a vial of your tap water, you put it in an envelope. I don't even think I needed to put a stamp on it. Send it to the water authority. And the nicest chemist I've ever talked to in my entire life called me back and he's like, yeah, so is there you know, something going on with your water? What are you, you know, looking for information about? I was like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm a home brewer and I just want to make sure that I know what's in my water. And he's like, oh my goodness, this is great. And then I ended up cool. here and he was so helpful and he still emails me with updated information. So um, that was a, a sidebar, but um, that, you know, there's lots of different ways you can get that water report. Um, I had a similar experience. Um, there was a regular at one of my friend's breweries who worked for the water district and um, he just uh, has me on an email where anytime the water is updated at all, he just copies me in on the email. And in Oregon, um, we have uh, bull run water and we switch between a couple different water sources. And whenever that happens, it's, it's, we still have pretty soft water and not much changes. So you can brew without um, any salt additions generally. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, there is a slight change. And there was one time that they changed the water sources and the water hadn't been used through certain pipes for a little while. And uh, there was some uh, sediment in the water. And so when I noticed I was filling up the hot liquor tank, there was some like copper sediment. And yeah. I called them, just the general information number, told them uh, what had happened. And they ended up flushing all the water from the neighborhood through a couple different fire hydrants to get all that sediment out of the water. So even if you're at home and you notice things like that, uh, the water district is pretty responsive on all that kind of stuff. Yep, definitely. And and we usually get like little cards, you know, um, on your apartment door or your, your house in the mail when they are flushing um, water um, when they're going to be doing fire hydrant stuff. Yeah. So it's like, don't be concerned if your water is brown when you're running it out of your tap. I'm like, I'm a little yeah, concerned, yeah. but <laughs> I'll run it for a little bit longer. Um, all right, so going back to the um, presentation here, I'm getting a little long-winded. Um, there are some like alternate it. options, and um, I did see uh, in the comments, even though I'm not supposed to be looking at the chat right now, um, there are alternate options for you to get um, information about your specific water source to your apartment, your house, wherever you're, you're brewing, um, or your brewery. One of them, um, Ward Labs, is really popular. Um, you can send in um, a sample of your water to Ward Labs, and for $42, I think, the, the kit costs. Um, they will send you back, it's specific for brewing, um, they will send you back a, a lab report on your water um, that, that you send them in. So that's an inexpensive and, and kind of a, um, an easily accessible option. And then uh, Lamotte makes um, test kits. So those are about 140 bucks, a little bit more of an investment for a home brewer, but um, we certainly um, you know, have them at the brewery because water changes um, on a daily basis. So you might want to, you know, check your numbers, um, you know, every few months, um, you know, seasonally, whatever you choose to do, just kind of get a feel for are there any spikes and things that I should be concerned about. Um, and then pro brewers, ask your chem supplier, um, you're spending a lot of money on chemicals from them. Um, and most of them will test your water for free um, and give you give you some feedback on that too. Okay, um, next slide here. So sample water report, which styles work best with your water? The top left here, I've got a summary of those six um, ions from the water report, as well as a couple calculated values, which are helpful to know. 
Um, and then we have um, from John Palmer's How to Brew um, book, which many of us might be familiar with. Um, he's got this water cube, which is kind of interesting because it helps determine, uh, or at least give you an idea, based on the type of water that I have, um, what type of beer um, is best suited for my water. We've heard through you know all of the history uh, of beer on um, lectures presentations books that you know we all know that you know ipas were invented in england burton and trent like there's classic water styles um where specific beers originated um because of the water of the region that they were originally brewed um so if we take a look at here um, starting off with let's take a look at um structure so when I take a look at calcium with 27.3 parts per million um, base, you can see on the cube that that's not even on the chart. So we want to get to at least 60, or I'm sorry, 50. But if we follow this down, the way that this works here is you follow it down the cube. Um, the beer here is best um, kind of uh, made for softer um, mouthfeel type of beers, um, softer profile things. Um, if we take a look at color um, in the form of residual alkalinity over here. Um, residual alkalinity, without going into a ton of detail about it, is a calculation you can do by taking your total alkalinity from your water report and then subtracting your calcium value divided by 1.4 and then subtracting your magnesium value minus 1.7. So when you do that calculation, I get 47 for my RA number. So if I take a look at 47 over here, it's basically directly in between zero and positive 100. Follow this over, the Rochester water profile is geared more towards beers that are in the amber to darker um, area. Um, and as you can see, things continue to, to go on. We talked a little bit about the sulfate to chloride ratio, which we can get into in a little bit more detail. Um, if you want to make a hoppier beer, you want a greater amount of sulfate. If you want a beer that's more um, malt focused, you want that ratio to be a lot lower. So our sulfate to, close, uh, sulfate to chloride ratio in Rochester, you get just by dividing um, sulfate uh, or the amount of chloride divided by, or sulfate divided by chloride uh, gives you 0.3. So according to this uh, brewing cube, the water here is uh, best suited for maltier styles. So what does that mean? That means that I can only brew malty, soft, amber to dark colored beers here. Without adjusting your water. So. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. without adjusting my water. It doesn't mean that that's all I can brew. It means that um, that's that's kind of where we're starting at. Luckily for us, um, our, our uh, main, our best seller is a Scotch Ale. Um, which is really interesting because, you know, IPAs are all the rage, but um, Scotch Ale is the number one selling um, beer in our uh, grocery chain. We have um, Wegmans here, which um, if you're from the East Coast, you know about Wegmans. If you're not, um, it's a different story, but it's, uh, it's not as cool. No, it's way cooler than all the other grocery stores on the planet. So anyway, <laughs> continuing on. So I've got this great water profile, but what I really want to brew is um, I want to brew an IPA. So this chart that you see on the left-hand side here um, is from John Palmer's water book. Um, so John Palmer and Colin Kaminsky uh, wrote this. Looks like internet problem, but I know Nicole Hoffman is talking about how we collect all of this information to um, calculate. Um, oh, I can't tell if we're all gone or not. Oh. Uh, but Nikki is just talking about um, she has used a lot of different resources to collect all this information. You can read water books, you can see charts in how to brew, and um, different uh, websites will help you with calculators and things like that. Uh, but in general, this isn't, all this information isn't just found from small or from one place. This is all collected from 
bunch of different sources. And I just wanted to pop in really quick because we didn't talk about yeast quite as much because water profiling is so technical. Um, but I wanted to say um, for all the home brewers out there, um, temp control and fermentation, uh, it's really cool if you go back down to basics and just brew styles based on the temperature that you have outside. And if you don't have temperature control and you don't have, um, hi. if you don't have temperature control and you don't have, um, any way to like make a lager in the middle of the summer, make a lager in the winter. If it's summer, make it phase on, get wild with it. And if it's too intimidating to mess with water profiling, um, just uh, hang out with your yeast and brew seasonal beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, sorry, I went away for a bit and came back again. Um, we've got another 15 minutes. Is that where we're at at this point? Are we done at 30? I can't remember. 15 minutes? Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I need to just hustle through some of this so we can at least show you the spreadsheet. So let me um, go back to sharing. And um, thanks, Natalie, for the heads up that uh, everything went to shit. Um, let's see. Okay. So um, on the screen share, I want to brew an IPA. On the bottom right-hand side, John Palmer, who's um, another really big, uh, well, John Palmer is a huge contributor, obviously, with the Water Book. He has a free app, um, and it's called Palmer's Water Adjustment App, um, and I've got links to it in the presentation and everything. Um, basically, what it allows you to do is look up any style that's in the BJCP um, guidelines, and then it gives you the ranges for the ions that we're looking for. So this is just a screenshot from my phone um, of the ranges. So if you don't have the water book, you can get this information for free from his app. Um, so this is the same exact uh, range of, of stuff that we're looking for. Um, so going to the next slide here, um, we've got all this information about our water now. Now is the time to let the experts do some of the calculating for us. So I've linked here to three different tools that have pros and cons um, for each of them um, to help you make those uh, or figure out what sort of water adjustments uh, you want to make to uh, for the, the target type of beer that you're making. Um, so the Palmer's Brewing app, um, is free. If you don't have um, a computer anymore, if everything you have is cloud-based um, and uh, you don't have Excel or, you know, um, things like that. Um, it's a really helpful tool and you don't need to have um, an actual um, iOS platform or, or Windows operating machine. Um, for Brune Water and Easy Water Calculator, you will need Excel. Um, so, there's um, pros and cons to that. Easy water calculator um, works really well. Um, it's pretty um, easy to, to use. It's intuitive, there's good instructions, but unfortunately it doesn't calculate pH, which is something that is really important when we're talking about um, brewing. Brewing water does. Um, so it's the most complicated one, but it's probably the one that um, is most helpful once you really kind of do a deep dive into water chem. So what I'm going to do next is stop sharing this window, um, and I'm going to share um, a sample of the Brune water um, spreadsheet. So I have this running in Google Sheets um, right now, and hopefully it works well. Um, but it's the only way that I could get extra data in the spreadsheet. So um, all of the images are um, not part of the actual free download that you get, but this PDF version will have this information so you can kind of see it and compare and contrast it. So we're gonna bounce around. You can see at the bottom there's tabs um, that are numbered one through five, um, but the way that you actually go through this in a way that makes sense to me and I think that makes it easier to use we're gonna bounce around. Um, so I've got a slide um, in the presentation that kind of guides you through where to enter stuff and what order to do stuff in so it kind of makes sense. 
So the first place we're gonna start is by entering that water profile information. So again, this is from Palmer's um, app. I've saved my water profile in there, so I have access to it all the time. If I go and type in these values really quickly, um, my magnesium is 6.5, um, sodium is 20.8. Um, there's also a lot of really good information. So my water report doesn't list bicarbonate, um, but if I click on this link, um, Dr. Brungard here has gone and given you information. So if you have um, your uh, alkalinity is what your water report is telling you as um, calcium carbonate, you can convert that to bicarbonate just by taking the 70 um, parts per million they get for alkalinity by 1.22. Um, so that's all we have to do for that is 70 to convert. So 70 times um, so an Excel spreadsheet, uh, 70 times 1.22. And if I did that correctly, right here in yellow is where it shows that same value from my water report. Carbonate um, is not reported. We're not gonna worry about carbonate. Um, sulfate, 11.8. And then chloride, we've got 36 parts per million. So, so far, so good. You can also do um, gallons or liters, depending on, um, you know, what, what uh, unit system outside of the U.S. if you um, are more familiar with. The second tab we're going to click on is sparge acidification. There's pros and cons to acidifying your sparge water, and it's a much more detailed topic than we have to run into today. So I'm just going to go in and um, set the volume of sparge water to treat as zero. I'm not going to treat my sparge water um, and not go into the pros and cons of that just today. Um, so you're just treating your mash, right? Just treating the mash water. Yep. Our strike water or the water that we're mashing in with. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the water adjustment tab. And again, these are all things that I've kind of added in to try to hopefully explain the spreadsheet a little bit better. Um, but what I want to do is add my um, water volumes in here. So this is the um, American IPA recipe I came up with um, for us to use as, a, as an example for this profiler. Um, we want to make a finished five gallon batch of an American IPA, really simple malt bill. It's pale malt with a little bit of crystal for color and a little bit of flavor. Um, and we're going to use um, 6.3 gallons of treated mash water um, to mash in with. So that water volume goes right here, 6.3. Um, we're not treating sparge water to leave that at zero. And then this total batch volume is what is your post boil? You've got it in your um, either your fermenter or um, your carboy, wh whatever your fermenting vessel is. Um, what, what are you going to have? Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. It's before, so you've already boiled it off. It's what's in your kettle before you cool that down and put it into your fermenting vessel. So if we're so thinking of a little bit of loss from boiling. Yes, exactly. So we've got some losses from boiling. And if you're anything like me, you know, brewing on the driveway, I always spill something and I end up losing, losing beer along the way um, or wort along the way. So I'm just going to say as a, conservative estimate that um, I'll have five and five and a half um, gallons um, to, to try to transfer to my fermentation vessel. I'm probably going to lose about a half gallon um, along the way. So we've got our water um, amounts in there. The third thing I'm going to do then, or uh, step three, step four, losing count at this point, is there's a spot for it uh, for you to enter in your grain bill. Um, so when you're making lighter beers, um, the lighter colored grains um, don't have uh, a huge effect on your mash pH. Um, it doesn't acidify your mash as much as darker malts do. So if I'm making a porter, I'm probably not going to have to do as much to my water um, as I might to get um, a pale ale or an IPA or something like that. Um, so for my recipe that we created, um, we're going to do 14.3 pounds of pale malt and then um, just because it's already here um, 0.3 pounds of crystal malt 
So now it's giving me some information that's helpful. It's giving me my grain bill. It's calculated my liquor to grist ratio. So how many quarts of um, water am I using per pound of grain? And that's a good range to be in. It's given my um, estimated beer color, which is good to know. And then right now it's telling me what my estimated mash pH would be with um, this grain bill, that amount of water, and my Rochester water profile. And it's showing that I want to make a lighter colored beer. My mash pH should be somewhere in the range of 5.3 um, to 5.4. Um, so that's that. It sounds like um, we're running short on time, but basically what we would do it, um, at, from this point forward to be able to answer some of your questions is go into the water adjustment um, area. I created a custom user profile using, um, or a custom target profile based on, um, again, the American IPA um, values. And then um, comparing that to the Rochester water profile, it's giving me a better idea of what the actual mash profile would be. Um, so the difference between I need 100 parts per million of calcium, I've only got 27, I need more calcium is what it's telling me. And this is where we can start going and kind of tinkering with, all right, so in order for me to get calcium, I have options um, to add calcium chloride or calcium sulfate, which are two of the more common um, brewing salts that we use. Both of them help lower the mash pH um, and um, calcium chloride will raise both calcium and chloride, but calcium sulfate will add um, calcium and sulfate. So um, again, I think um, the explanation here is a little shorter than I um, was planning on and I apologize for that, um, but we can go ahead and get to some, um, some questions and see where we're at, at least as far as that goes. I'll say one more thing. With these calculators that she was just showing you, um, it's really easy to just write in like gypsum and uh, instead of using gypsum, write out the actual chemical, uh, all the different ions or whatever. So you can see because if someone writes gypsum on something, I'm like, shit, which one is calcium in? And then when you're adjusting those um, calculators, you can actually look and see if I'm going to adjust my sulfate to chloride ratio, which of these has sulfate in it. So then you can uh, divide, you can actually do that calculation because you're like, wait, I just got totally lost. It said that I don't have enough calcium, but I added calcium and now what do I do? And then you just kind of go in and stop, slow down, look at where the calcium is, look where the sulfate is, look where the carbon is. And then that way you can um, kind of dial in your recipe a little bit more because it's really easy to get lost in all of the numbers because you'll like, what I'll do generally is I have a um, baseline like I showed you guys for the different beer styles. And then sometimes I'm like, well, I want this beer to be a little bit more like if I'm making a Saison, I'm like, I want some actual minerality in the beer. And um, I'll just use a reference of the beer that I've already made, but then I'll like enter a number and get a little lost. And then you just like stop and go back to the beginning, pay attention to um, the simple calcium, sulfate, all those sorts of things. But uh, like Nikki said, it's, it's hard to dive all the way into all these things because it's so complicated and so technical on so many different levels, but you don't have to make it so intense. You can not treat your water or um, like some people suggested in the comments uh, by treated water. So you kind of start from zero, filter it, whatever. Cool. So Nikki, Natalie, I know it's okay. So water chemistry, I, in my opinion, water chemistry and fermentation needs like their own seminars. So I'm not I know sure why they try to, Put the two in together into one but we obviously appreciate um, the amount of information you're able to give us in the short amount of time um so we do have uh we got three questions um i think one of them might have already been answered let's see if your local water supply company doesn't offer an up-to-date water profile, who do you prefer to use to test your water do you use any tools in-house that are commercially available. Um, so actually, before that's answered, I would like to say, because this is shameless plug time, because I work at a homebrew store, but we do carry something like this. Um, oh, cool. Water analysis kit. Um, you know, 
and basically are you titrating what's in the water or something say that again are you titrating what's in the water is that what the kit does i am not sure um i guess i could probably we could probably post uh, like a link to like the actual description um but is that like, the lamott kit it sure is yeah so we talked about um the lamott kit that's the hundred and plus dollar one um and then you can send your water into ward labs yep um Cool. Perfect. Um, or on the the commercial level, ask your your chem rep. Um, that was something that we we touched on very briefly, or at least I did. I don't know if I was here in the presentation, but I talked about it maybe to my you dog. Did, yeah. Um, yeah. So I. <laughs> it's, and don't it's, be don't be shy about reaching out to like I said, uh, people in your water district because they want to help and. Um, Another thing that we, it doesn't really have to do with like pH in your fermentation, but um, a lot of water districts want to be in, in cahoots with your water waste, um, your wastewater too. So uh, they want to help you. They're not trying to ding you on stuff. So set up systems and, you know, talk to people and make sure you're, I don't know, just talk to people. They're great. Water nerds unite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, our next question that we're going to ask is, um, like the water calculators mentioned, do you have a favorite tool to use for your recipe building? Um, so when we were going to talk about this, I was like texting Nikki about, or like emailing her. Um, this is what some of my friends use. My friend Megan, that's actually, or Meg, that's in the comments over here. She uh, was suggesting a couple different sources, but um, based on a bunch of different books, like I talked about earlier, um, we wrote our own calculators and basically what it does is it's just the exact same thing in an Excel spreadsheet and you have, um, you just enter in the value of your current water, um, ions and then it just calculates against, um, your goal. So like, it's exactly what Nikki showed you, but you can just kind of use the calculations and just make your own spreadsheet because that's what I do because Sometimes it's hard to use other people's stuff. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's, that's what I do. But. Yeah, we, we did the same thing. Um, we built our own, uh, well, our brew sheet is constantly evolving, but uh, building it from <laughs> Building it from scratch, um, you know, really allows you to. It's easier to understand because you do the research to to put it together. Um, and for home brewing, I did the same thing. Um, and the if you're really interested, I, I like to know why things are the way that they are um, and how they work. Um, so um, it's in the presentation again that we didn't get to, but one of the books that I would highly recommend, um, maybe if you have a, a holiday coming up or a birthday and um, someone wants to spend 50 bucks on you, um, you can nerd out all you want on the handbook of, handbook of brewing calculations. Um, everything from, you know, this is my, the, the amount of sugar, this is my target ABV, um, you know, for this. And, and it'll, you can walk yourself back all the way to how that calculates to, you know, how much malt you need and, and what you need to, like all the considerations for that, how much sparge water based on, you know, the size of your vessel, like all of these crazy calculations. So um, between that, we have a, a brew sheet, a custom brew sheet um, that we built and then um, a water calculator based on a lot of those same things. But comparing that water calculator that we use on a commercial level to brewing water, I know a lot of commercial breweries use brewing water and I'm getting very similar values. So um, now that I understand how to use that spreadsheet, um, it's, it's a useful tool and it's free and it's already built. And the instructions part, the first tab is really in depth and you hover over the, the, uh, the cells and there's tons of good information in there. Um, mm -hmm. so. And I will say like for my brain specific, uh, there's all these things you can calculate and then there's some witchy shit that happens that you can't really like calculate for where in my brain we have all the calculations set up and then, um, sometimes, depending on the ABV of the beer, if I don't um, pretend like there's 2% acidulated malt, I can't correctly um, calculate how much lactic acid to add into my mash. But I know that if I add over a certain milliliter uh, volume of lactic acid to my mash, then I will um, over acidify. 
So it's like, it says it needs 106. I have a small brew house, but it's like, it'll say it needs 160 milliliters. But I know if I go over 70 milliliters, then I'm going to drop my pH down to like 5.1. So yeah. you can definitely, you, know, you get you to know your, to your equipment. Yeah, you, you get to know your equipment. Um, another great book I would recommend is um, Ray Daniels, Designing uh, Designing Great Beers, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good um, recipe development focused um, book that gives you examples and how to do calculations yourself. Um, obviously, you've got um, another really, uh, Beer Smith being a really popular um, uh, software tool um, that I've seen commercial breweries use as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot of free and um, paid tools out there. But um, another one that I really like is um, linked in the PDF that I can't think of right now. But there's really good water chemistry information. And you can build, um, it's got a recipe uh, building tool in it and all of these different things. So there's a lot of free resources out there that at least give you a place to start. And then as you continue to brew and develop and learn more about, you know, your result from your results, you can make your own adjustments from there. And then something Nikki kind of touched on when she was specifically talking about like for the Rochester water profile, once you've got to dial in your specific water profile, you can nerd out. And if you want to um, say my water is this, but I want to mimic the water in Dusseldorf to make a Dort wonder, then you get all sorts of wild and can dial those things in. But that's a whole a whole other level of getting weird and sometimes it doesn't work at first. But that's what a lot of people will do. And if you think of something like um, Goza, the original beer was brewed in Gothlar, which had a higher salinity. So when they started brewing it in Leipzig, when the style was revitalized, um, they're adding um, salt, sea salt, yep. you know, sodium chloride to mimic that water. It's obviously a little bit skewed, but when you pay attention to those little finite details, that's kind of how you get extra nerdy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we're sorry. I'm not laughing at your what you're saying, but I just had a recent um, boo boo with uh, adding too much salt to a goza, so I'm still a little, still a little. Uh, <laughs> How much did you add? I'm traumatized. I I'm done. I'm not gonna say this on the air. I'll say. I want to know. No, no, four hundred percent. No, that doesn't mean anything. Okay, anyway. Okay, <laughs> if you want to get weird, I just made a um, okay, like a rice lager. <laughs> And I, I wanted it to be salty, so I added maboshi, which is a salt pickled plum. And I added like a ridiculous amount to it. And I was like, why the fuck isn't it salty? And um, so, like, if you've ever eaten a maboshi, it is the saltiest thing you have ever eaten in your life. It like hurts your soul, but it's so good. And um, when I added it to the beer, obviously, um, sodium chloride adds mouthfeel. And so you like add and add and add, and then you hit that like, point which i'm pr sure probably where you're at you're like it needs more it needs more and then you're like whoa, whoa i overdid it but um yeah, it was like a part of the game yeah miscalculated accident so we'll see we'll see how it turns out <laughs> <laughs> fermenting right now so i kind of want to try it yeah okay. we so we've got one more question and a couple yeah. minutes to go so the last question is is there any difference in water adjustments when doing cold mash slash non-enzymatic extraction? Does the chemistry affect the grains at any temp? I've actually never done um, a cold mash. Obviously, the enzymatic activity is way different, like you mm -hmm. said. But, Nikki, do you know anything about that? Not specifically, no. Um, I can't speak to that. Yeah, I yeah guess sorry. I'm, no, no, I'm, I guess I'm trying to think, too. What uh, if, I guess the only cold mash scenario I think of is like, like cold, like dark malt extraction. Yeah, like dark malt. Um, yeah. Which don't really give any enzymatic conversion anyway. So. What I have done is, so my little brewery, I don't have a hot liquor tank. So what I do is, it's kind of similar to home brewing where I put the volume of my strike water in the kettle and then I set the kettle to my strike temperature and then I just use a pump and pump that into my mash tun. Um, I once wanted, I wanted to see if I could make a black for litter bicep, and so I put the, all the dark malt in the um, strike water overnight in a bag and I didn't turn on the uh, water. And so it's cold seeped overnight and I didn't use lactic acid because that was my 
I think that I just wrote the recipe like the malt was in hot side because you're basically acidifying with the dark malt as you mash in. So it's kind mm-hmm. of like your last your lactate or you know um, acidity component to it. So I just I wrote the um, salt like it was hot extracted. I don't know if that answers your question directly, but that's what I did. Okay. Yeah. So s- steeping for f- f- flavor and, and not getting that really astringent color, but not flavor. like yeah. yeah. Yep. It's like the cold brew of brewing. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you, you test your mash pH um, ideally within the first 10 to 20 minutes that you've mashed in. Um, and you want to cool your your mash sample down um, to room temperature so you can leave it, you know, sitting out on your, your brew table. Um, but having a, a pH meter is really important to all of this. Um, so um, you can buy relatively inexpensive mash pH meters to start. I'm sure that you guys sell them at the homebrew shop. Um, a lot of homebrew shops too will um, calibrate them for you because they usually come with um, oh, cool. like one, you know, 7.0 solution, one 4.0, and then you've got to invest in your own. Um, and calibrating these inexpensive meters is kind of silly. Um, yeah. But, you know, you can get, again, like maybe a birthday is coming up, um, a, a decent um, pH meter for, for home, um, or, you know, your, your brewery for, you know, a hundred, hundred plus bucks. Um, and I think, I think it's a really good investment if you're going to be serious about, you know, making positive changes to your, your brew, um, hitting those targets ideally between 5.2 and 5.6 for your mash pH. Um, I'm sorry. I have a deaf and blind dog and she has to go My outside. My dog's like getting to, they're both like, what's up? Well, on that note. Yeah. well, thanks you guys for coming. Thank you, Natalie and Nikki. Um, great presentation. Yeah, great, amazing presentation. This presentation will show up to be viewed at a later date, just in a few moments. And, and we'll add our email for contact information. Not that I don't know if you want to talk to us, you but guys can. Drop them in the chat, and, and yeah, you can see that chat too if they want to review yeah. things. And you guys, this was so cool. Thank you so much. Also, Natalie, can you like give us a little shot of your fringe? Um, I keep, <laughs> yes, superpower. I know, I kept seeing him. Um, it's <laughs> really cool until you try to reach across the table. So you have to like. <laughs> you're to all the food. You're like, oh, okay. so yeah, I, I tuck it. Off of it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Follow us on Instagram and listen to Brewed Up podcast wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.